Hello and welcome to episode one of Unanimity, a podcast of the Mises Institute. I'm Mark Thornton. Today is my birthday, but more importantly, it's the 40th anniversary of one of the craziest decisions of my life. I think of myself as a risk-averse person, but 40 years ago, I threw caution to the wind and it turned out to be the best decision I ever made. I say this not to promote crazy, risky decisions, but to encourage you to be open to new ways of looking at your world and the issues we face. For me, today is about remembering and celebrating that crazy decision. Episode one is about a relatively mundane issue, not at the top 10 of the world's leading issues. It is, however, an issue that will help me develop the template of the podcast and to show you how I hope to achieve the elusive goal of unanimity. It will also be relatively short, but hopefully everyone will learn something brand new. If you don't learn anything new, I would like to offer you an opportunity to become an associate producer of this podcast. The general concept today is labor markets. It's how and where people who want to work and people who want to employ workers come together for their mutual benefit. If you think about your own situation, the number of potential individual factors to consider on both sides of labor agreements is enormous, and yet millions make such agreements involving wages and salaries and benefits, hours, duties, etc., every day, sometimes halfway across the globe and now into outer space. It seems to work pretty well. Of course, it's not perfect, but it is certainly better than the ancient days living hand-to-mouth, working for your tribe or clan. It's also better than the old days of being a serf, being tied to the land, or being an indentured servant or slave. These are the systems of labor that dominated the world until about 300 years ago. The market mode of labor contracts produces better results for both sides. It is voluntary, so it's more flexible and dynamic. It can also result in long-lasting relationships as well. Over the long run, jobs have become less arduous and more rewarding and personally gratifying. We humans identify with our role in the social division of labor. Beyond our homes and family, if one of your personal identifiers isn't job-related, people probably think of you as a weirdo or a freeloader. On the market, we are rewarded based on the value we provide to others. That reward is not determined primarily by our employer or by us, but by the market's estimate of our contribution. Irrespective of the level of the reward, we gain personal satisfaction knowing that we are serving others, even if that means working by yourself in the back of your closet. Entrepreneurs, with the help of capitalists, pay labor up front even before the revenue is generated and available. Capitalists earn interest from fronting the money for all forms of physical capital, raw materials, utilities, accounts receivable, and payroll. It is important to realize that well-functioning labor markets and the rise of Western civilization and our standard of living is not an accident, coincident, or matter of chance. The free labor market is a critical component of what we call capitalism. Not surprisingly, the anti-slavery movement was led by the liberal philosophers, the bourgeois, and the classical economists, such as Adam Smith. At the other end of the spectrum, Karl Marx wanted to do away with wages and labor markets, but never said what he would use to replace it. This episode is about minimum wage laws. The special topic of this episode is probably familiar to most everyone, especially the arguments on both sides of the political debate. Here we will largely ignore that debate and dig a lot deeper into more important issues. The topic of the minimum wage law, and I propose that we can all think about it in the same way, means that it doesn't have to be an ongoing divisive policy issue that divides us. Clearing away the divisive interest of politics provides a clear opening to remove an important obstacle to career development so that people can have an opportunity to help themselves in a reliable way. Here we are questioning the effectiveness or ineffectiveness 
of a policy in achieving a shared goal and set of values. Let's start at the top. I've talked to many supporters and opponents of minimum wage laws, and they are neither stupid, gullible, disreputable, or mean-spirited. However, in short-form debates, editorials, and press conferences, you certainly get that impression. Political opponents of the minimum wage law think proponents don't know how the world works, and political promoters of the minimum wage law think opponents are cruel and don't know what it's like for low-skilled workers to support a family. Opponents say the minimum wage law kills jobs. Proponents say it doesn't. I will argue that these arguments really don't matter much and that now is the ideal time for my preferred policy of repealing the minimum wage altogether. Even a simple issue like the minimum wage is actually very complex and far-reaching. A plethora of factors affect local labor markets and individual employment decisions. The recent example of California's fast food minimum wage increase is a great example of the complexity involved. It is a very complicated issue that is spun in public discourse solely on the topic of short-term changes in the unemployment rate. Public discourse never has an opportunity to vent the critical issues of why people support or oppose the policy or the longer run and wide-ranging implications. More importantly, there is never an opportunity to discuss policy alternatives from either side. Most people I know want to help poor people and to see them have a good place in the economy alongside working with everybody else. Everyone I know wants the poor to have opportunities to prosper, and no one I know wants the poor to be stuck at the minimum wage level or to spend their lives trapped inside the welfare system. There are people who have different views, and they have even played an important role in American history, including counting amongst their numbers many leading American economists. I would name them, but they are not worthy of our consideration here. I'll discuss this historical role later in the podcast. Another group of people who don't count is the small number of those who are actively opposing or supporting the minimum wage for purely self-interested motives. These are the business and labor groups that provide the funding and research reports and political lobbying. These groups don't employ many minimum wage workers and have ulterior motives. Labor groups such as unions hope to use higher minimum wage rates to disadvantage manual labor and small businesses in favor of higher skilled labor union labor. Business groups also want to use the minimum wage law to disadvantage their smaller competitors that typically use more low-skilled workers. So how important is the minimum wage law after all? Well, there are only about 1.3 million people in the U.S. hourly workforce that earn the federal minimum wage or less which is roughly 1% of the U.S. hourly workforce in 2022. So we should be surprised at all the attention this policy gets. The fact that some states and local governments have higher minimum wage doesn't increase or diminish the importance of the federal law because these states and local governments are typically all high-cost, high-wage areas to begin with. But even with this small number of only 1% of the hourly workforce, the surprise gets even more surprising when we realize that only 14% of that number earn the minimum wage. The rest earn below that. 86% earn the sub-minimum wage. But these are usually restaurant workers who get the majority of their earnings serving customers and receiving tip money. In full, they normally earn much more than minimum wage workers, and some jobs at expensive restaurants are good, lifelong breadwinner jobs. So the people earning the federal minimum wage is less than 0.18 of 1%. And of those who are 25 years or older and still earning the minimum wage, 
they are only 16% of that teeny group. If you think in terms of a stadium with 100,000 people in it, that group would be just 28 people in the stadium. And if the stadium reflected the entire workforce instead of just hourly workers, it would be over 200,000 people in the stadium with those same 28 making the minimum wage. Of course, there are a bunch of people that earn just a little bit more than the minimum wage as well. But minimum wage workers are young, often just starting out of high school, part-time with little education and little job experience. Nearly half of all jobs paying the federal minimum wage are in low-wage states in the South, where there are no state minimum wage laws. There are virtually no breadwinners earning the minimum wage. And this is just what we would expect particularly with a falling, real, inflation-adjusted minimum wage. With no increases in many years, inflation has eaten away at the purchasing power of the minimum wage, and this has reduced the plethora of distortions that it has caused in post-World War II labor markets. For example, this erosion has resulted in a great reduction in the racial and sexual discrimination effect and the displacement effect of the minimum wage. The discrimination effect occurs when the minimum wage is relatively high. Ceteris paribus, all other factors equal, whites get more jobs, and racial minorities are forced into unemployment. Unemployment rates for minority teens are still higher than that of white teens. The displacement effect occurs when the minimum wage is relatively high. Ceteris paribus, or all other factors equal, older and more experienced and productive workers will seek jobs, displacing the younger, less experienced and less productive workers. This is particularly true of highly skilled, mechanized union workers displacing unskilled manual laborers and explains a motive of why unions are so keen to increase the minimum wage rate. This is also why we can't count union labor in terms of coming to our conclusion about the minimum wage. Their interest and the personal interest, self-interest of businesses is too directly tied to increasing the minimum wage. Generally, they support the minimum wage law and minimum wage increases And those union members that think otherwise might experience retribution from fellow members if they express their opposing views. In any case, we can see now that the time is great to eliminate the minimum wage law as it has very little impact on labor markets. Its elimination is highly unlikely to result in many people experiencing a job loss or cut in their pay rate or even less likely to experience a cut in their paycheck. Increases in the past of the minimum wage have been shown to reduce the number of hours worked and paychecks. Therefore, we might expect to see a few examples of small wage cuts, but with increased hours, for example. This brings us to all the attention the minimum wage law gets in introductory college economics classes. Part of the reason the minimum wage law gets so much attention is that it is an issue that some college students are intimately familiar with. Another part of the reason is that it's a good example of the wide-ranging negative effects of a seemingly isolated piece of legislation. In addition to all the distortions to labor markets we have already seen, it also creates disadvantages for small family-run or mom-and-pop businesses and creates relative advantages for big corporations. Big companies already have lobbyists, lawyers, research operations, access to high-tech and robotic substitutes for labor. For example, McDonald's is already well set up for computer kiosks to take orders because the ordering and kitchen aspects are already relatively high-tech and automated. They have research departments and easy access to capital to make such purchases of kiosks. Mom-and-pop restaurants 
have almost none of this and are disadvantaged by the law. This is why some companies and business groups have supported the minimum wage law. Well, what about economists? Well, if the current minimum wage doesn't really matter too much, and if an effective minimum wage only has bad distortive effects on our economy, why is it that even some economists still support the minimum wage and argue that it should be increased? Well, even if we set aside all economists that get paid to advocate for and against the minimum wage, there would still be a good many who understand the negative consequences and still advocate for the minimum wage. Economists are generally against the minimum wage, or at least increases in the minimum wage rate. However, this has changed in recent years as the inflation-adjusted wage has fallen, and more importantly, as the ideological views of the economics profession have distinctly drifted leftward. Examining surveys of economists on the minimum wage, there is a decline in the opposition and an increase in support for the minimum wage law and increased wage levels over time but support levels are still higher than the general population or in the other social sciences. The reason given for opposition to minimum wage laws are standard economic responses regarding the distortions of the economy and the minimum wage law's inability to effectively and positively affect the targeted group. In contrast, the reasons given for support of the minimum wage law are clustered around equity, fairness, justice, along with what some of them see as minor labor market imperfections. The central concern of proponents is economic inequality, but this issue is illusionary for several reasons. One, economic inequality in the U.S. has changed very little if calculations used after tax income, and if cash welfare benefits are added to earned income. Most common statistical measures of economic inequality do not account for all the taxes lost by high earners and do not account for most cash welfare benefits received by low earners. So the statistics you and even most economists have seen are widely inaccurate. The economic status of college students, taught by professors at major university, has risen significantly over time with the rising family income of the two highly educated high-income earner households, who also, by the way, are having fewer children per household. And three, because the minimum wage law only significantly impacts very young single adults, during high school and college years, increases in the minimum wage have virtually no significant impact on economic inequality. Another concern has been expressed by the general public and economists regarding the minimum wage law that goes something like this. Even though the minimum wage law doesn't help, and even though it creates unintended distortions, and even though it may backfire on our intentions, it's still important to send a message that we all care about the unskilled hourly workforce. Why not just keep it on the books, they say. Repealing it would send the wrong message, they say. Stated thusly, this sentiment is a powerful statement for the status quo. But let's look at the original intent of minimum wage laws. The original proponents of the minimum wage law that I mentioned early in the podcast were called the progressives of the early 20th century America. These are obviously not the same as the people currently call themselves progressives, but were more similar to the socialist of Britain, the fascist of Italy, and the national socialists or Nazis in Germany. American progressives, including many economists, supported eugenics. Eugenics during the early 1900s was a mix of scientific and pseudoscientific studies and beliefs. Eugenical programs, such as immigration restrictions, focused either on the elimination or fostering of heritable traits. 
Many followers of eugenics believe that compulsory sterilization was the most effective way to rid a population of inferior people, uh, such as my relatives. When immigration restrictions and literacy tests prove ineffective, progressives turn increasingly to the minimum wage law to exclude minorities, women, and other non-desirables from the primary workforce. Women would be homemakers, racial minorities would be agricultural workers, or shunted into ghettos, prisons, and insane asylums, or maintained on the public dole, isolated from the view of mainstream America. Later, the New Deal was the initial heyday of the minimum wage law. Northern industries, for example, knew that the minimum wage law would disadvantage their competitors in the low-wage South. The South African apartheid regime used a combination of prohibiting black workers from some high-paying managerial jobs, as well as minimum wage laws that were used to reserve the good industrial jobs for whites, leaving the marginal and more dangerous jobs for blacks. The evidence is very strong that the heyday of the minimum wage law in the U.S. discriminated against minorities and unskilled youth. If you look at the U.S. unemployment rate from 1970 to 2020, you see that the average unemployment rate was 5%, but the average unemployment rate for blacks and other minorities was around 12%, and the average unemployment rate for black and Hispanic teens was 35%. The minimum wage effectively induced racial discrimination against minorities, and the young. So in conclusion, we should note that there are other policies that the American government has used in the past and still does that are ineffective, counterproductive, and turn out to be originally inspired by racist motives. But the minimum wage law is one of the best examples. Many countries have no minimum wage law, and the fact that you might have never heard that and that no atrocities have occurred in those countries speaks volumes about the extent of our political discourse today. In addition to repealing the minimum wage law, there is much that can be done to level the playing field for our young and low-skilled populations. But all of these ideas and policies involve increasing their freedom and independence, their control over their own lives, and reductions of government interference in their lives and workplace activities. Thank you for listening to episode one of the Unanimity Podcast. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute.